bhavavatu sahanau bhunaktu sahavir karavavahai tejasvi navadhi tamastu mavid vishadahai aum shanti 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 Namaste. So I found this wonderful invocation in the Taittiriya Upanishad while doing research for the upcoming topics. And I wanted to share it with you. In fact, I want to make it the standard introduction for this series on Vedanta Sutra because it ideally sets the mood and the tone for the student-teacher relationship. So just so you don't have any misunderstood Sanskrit words, let's go over the synonyms. Aum, oh my Lord, Saha, together, now, both the teacher and the taught, Avatu, may he protect. Sahanau, us both together. Bhunaktu, may he nourish. Saha, together. Viryang, strength arising from knowledge, etc. Karavavahai, may we both accomplish. Tejasvi, who are both bright. Navadhitam, let what we read be well read. Astu, be brilliant. Ma, may we never. Vidvishavahai, entertain ill feeling toward each other. Aum, O oh my Lord. Shantihi, Shantihi, Shantihi. Peace, peace. Peace. So like all Vedic mantras, this one begins and ends with Aum. One of these days, I want to do a deep dive into the meaning and function and the significance and power of Aumkar. It's a very special mantra, unique in the whole Vedic language, Sanskrit. And the reason we say Shanti, Shanti, Shanti three times is to protect against the three kinds of miseries or disturbances. That is Adhyatmic, Adhibhotic, and Adhidaivic, or miseries due to the body, miseries due to nature, natural causes, like hurricanes and floods and stuff like that. And Adhidaivic means miseries due to the demigods. Sometimes the demigods get paranoid when they see someone doing sadhana and they try to interfere. So this wards off all kinds of difficulties and leads us to success in our studies of Vedanta. So now I want to talk about the next topic that we're going to look at. And this is called the Anandam Adhikaranam. Anandarikaranam. So in Vedanta Sutra, there are many topics, and these are called Adhikaranam. Adhikara means a qualification, like a license. For example, if someone has Arati Adhikaranam, they can perform the arati in the temple. They know all the mantras, they know the procedure, what it means, why, and so on. So similarly, each subject or each topic 
in Vedanta Sutra is called an adhikaranam, meaning a, a specific competency that you get by studying this subject. So anandadhikaranam is the qualification or the competency to experience ananda or bliss. And specifically, this topic has to do with the five bodies. Now, we went over the five bodies way back in our work on Uladu Narpadu by Ramana Maharshi. But let's just go over it quickly again, because this is very important. The five bodies are the Anamaya Kosha, the food body, the Pranamaya Kosha, the energy body, the mano maya kosha, the mental body, the vijnana maya kosha, the causal body or will body, and the ananda maya kosha, the bliss body, pure consciousness, turiya. So in all these bodies, they're called moya, not maya, with a long A, but with short A, maya. And that means full or complete. And uh, kosha, of course, means a sheath or a covering. So the being, the original consciousness, the atma, is covered by these five sheaths. These are the upadis. Or at least this is one way to analyze upadis. Upadi means a covering that blocks one's realization of the self. It's like an asset, an adjunct, uh, something added to the being that blocks out the actual reality. So in this way, by going through the process of neti neti, not this, not this. One sets aside these sheaths one at a time until one comes to the Ananda Maya. Now, the question in this Adhikaranam is Is the Ananda really the self, or is it another layer of covering on the self? Now, most of the commentaries on Vedanta Sutra assume that the Ananda Maya Kosha is the self. But Shankaracharya disagrees. And strangely enough, uh, many of the additions, or several of the additions, of Shankara's commentary on Vedanta omit this. So it's a controversial point. But, oh, wait, we haven't even gotten to the really controversial point. <laughs> the uh, whole first chapter of Vedanta Sutra is about reconciliation of the apparent differences among the different scriptures, especially in the Upanishads. Sometimes words are used like the sun uh, or prana, life energy. And they actually refer to Brahman because this is the introduction to the worship of Brahman. And in the beginning, we worship Brahman in the saguna mode. Saguna Brahman means Brahman with qualities. But the ultimate goal of Vedanta is Nirguna Brahman, Brahman without qualities. Now, what's the difference? Well, we went over this uh, back in the ontology of Shakti series, that Saguna Brahman is imperceptible non-cognizable, non-conceptual, and non-dual Brahman, self, 
Awareness of awareness only. Awareness without an object, pure being, unconditioned, always free, always realized, frictionless, cannot be accepted nor rejected because it is everything, including ourself. So this is very difficult to realize. Uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around. In fact, it's impossible to wrap your mind around it because it's beyond mind, beyond intelligence. Only by realization. That's the only way to get it. So how do we approach that realization? We worship various symbols that represent Brahman, like Aum, like the various deities in Vedic culture. We've gone deeply into the Sri Vidya, which worships, worships the universal mother, Shakti, as Brahman. And similarly, there are many other different deities that one can worship according to one's taste. But one can also worship the sun as Brahman, the Gayatri mantra as Brahman, or prana as Brahman, for example, in Kundalini Yoga, and so on. There are many, many ways. In fact, actually anything, because <laughs> Brahman is the substrate or the root of everything. Anything can become a symbol for meditation on Brahman. A good example is the uh, meditation on nothingness, uh, which is introduced in both the tantras and in Buddha's teaching. And the wonderful thing about meditation on nothingness is that it reveals Brahman. How? <laughs> well, try it and see. But what happens is one imagines nothingness because you can't, there is actually no such thing as nothingness. There's always something everywhere. But if you start by meditating on space and emptiness, and the vastness of space, you can reach a point where you can at least conceive of nothingness. And this is beautiful, this is wonderful. This is a shelter, it's a refuge from the suffering of the material world. <clears throat> but it's still not Brahman. The one thing you will notice, or anyway I noticed, <laughs> when you get to actual nothingness is that there is still something. You, who is aware of the nothingness? Who is imagining the nothingness? See? And at that point, the light of Brahman bursts forth. <laughs> and one attains realization. So actually anything uh, can be used. And if one goes deep enough, you can find Brahman in it, through it, at the root of it, as its substrate. Now, of course, some objects are better than others because they share more attributes with Brahman, at least Saguna Brahman. For example, to meditate on a deity like Shiva or Vishnu or Shakti, any of the forms of Shakti, because they have certain attributes. They are all pervading, omnipresent. They are omnipotent. They can do anything, make anything happen. And they are omniscient, 
all-knowing, all-intelligent, all-wise. So these attributes are also in Brahman. And therefore, meditating on these deities, either with puja or mantra, or by hearing stories about them, or somehow or other remembering them, and also remembering that they are actually an expression of Brahman with qualities, Saguna Brahman, can lead to realization of Brahman. And so this is the uh, overriding topic in Vedanta Sutra. Do we worship Brahman with qualities or without qualities? And Shankaracharya's conclusion is that we begin from worshiping Saguna Brahman to attain the ultimate goal of Nirguna Brahman. That's complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.